a polynomial r to the e two and c three p of r to the e two, the one that looks like a trash can, and c three p of the human robot. And on my way back home from the movie theater, I told my mom and dad, "I'm going to grow up to become a robot scientist." And I followed my dreams, and I'm here today. Now, among these two robots, the robot r to the e two. Now, if you look at it, it's very peculiar. It's very interesting. Now. Uh, it moves in many different ways. It has wheels. It can walk with three legs. Sometimes walk with two legs. Has many, many different ty types of motion. And we call this novel mobile uh, mobile mechanism. So I think since I was a kid, when I saw this R two D two, I was inspired by that. And since then, we've built many, many different type of novel mobile mechanisms. A three leg robot that flips its hip body. A wheel leg hybrid robot, an amoeba robot that inverts itself, many different type of robots, and also leg robots in many different sizes, configurations, and different ways of making uh, robots walk with legs. Now, the other robot, C3PO, is a humanoid robot, and if uh, the movie Star Wars, you can see that these robots uh, help uh, people everyday lives. So this is, I think, was inspired. I think I was inspired by these robots to build uh, humanoid robots. Now, the famous architect Louis Sullivan once said, "Form follows function," which means that the shape of an object is really dictated by what it needs to do. So let's talk about human robots. Why do we need human robots? Now, since I was a little kid, uh, you know, I, will, I have a dream. I want to have robots living with us, doing the dishes, taking out the trash. How cool would that be? And I claim that for robots to be living with us in this environment. I claim the robot needs to be human shape and human size because this environment was designed for humans. Stair, these are designed for humans to walk up. Door handles, a certain height for humans to open up. So that's why we need human shape and human size. Uh, all these type of mobility uh, applications, unless the robot is a human shape, it won't be able to move. Not only that, but these type of disaster situations. Uh, so most of the robots currently that's being used are single taskers. They're designed to do one particular thing. But in this kind of scenarios, the robot needs to do many different type of things. It needs to operate cranes and use the tools designed for humans. And if you want to have these Swiss Army knife, a multi, uh, a tool that can many things, uh, human form will be very, very uh, useful. So in the past 20 years, we've been really focusing on these humanoid robots. And let me quickly show you some of the robots we developed from 2006 to 2016. So this robot is Darwin OP. It's a fully open source uh, human robot for research and education, one of the most widely used robots. Charlie is considered the United States' very first human adult sized human robot. Thor RD for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Sapphire, Shipboard Autonomous Firefighting Robots. It's a robot for the US Navy for firefighting. And Thor, Tactical Hazardous Operations Robot that uses novel series elastic actuators and many, many more. I think we've got more than a dozen different uh, sizes than human robots. However, during the past decade, we put a lot of time and effort into human robots, and it constantly falls down, it's really slow, and it has some doubts until now. And today, I'm very excited to show you our latest robot, Artemis. So again, you probably remember, it opens this robot, Darwin OP, in uh, 2010. The following year, we built with Charlie, Cognitive Humanity Autonomous Robot with Learning Intelligence. 2013, Thor OP, and 2014, Thor. And now the next generation of robots is open. Now, this robot is uh, developed using crowdfunding. Now, because this robot uses new technology that did not exist until now, you couldn't buy any of these uh, parts. So every single component, except for the sensors, computer, and wires, we designed and fabricated every single thing in the lab. We cut our own gears, even the motors, we hand wind the coils that we had to glue on the magnets to build everything. Now as an engineer, when I see this, I consider this as sexy. <laughs> so this is the thigh link. If you have time, I'll talk about the topology optimization design that we have also done. Is it beautiful? So finally, the lower body of Artemis assembly is done. And this is the lower body of Artemis. We're doing a range of motion test. It can move exactly or more than human motion, except for the angle, which I'll talk about too. Now, this robot is not just for walking. It can run and eventually jump and do part four. So if you see in the background, this is what we want to do with these robots. Hyperdynamic locomotion. 
And we unveiled this video just last year. And this is the Artemis' lower body. So at the end it says, Artemis, coming soon. And that soon is today. And I'm very excited to show you Artemis, our latest human robot. So Artemis stands for a robot, uh, there you go, Advanced Robotic Technology for Enhanced Mobility and Improved Stability. Now we actually do testing outdoors without any tethers. It's that stable. Let me show you some of the, uh, the performances. So if you see over here, we're really trying to kick it. We're not baby and really trying to kick it and it cannot fall down. Pushing it from the forward, sideways as you find is much more difficult. If you push or pull from the sideways, the two legs can hit each other, but still it performs very well. Kicking from the back is very, very stable. Pulling, pushing, and as you guys can see, we're really trying to kick it. You want to tough it up a little bit, so we're throwing objects at it. Not only your body, but it can hit any type of any joints, at legs, and it's still fine. Now, it's walking over a five centimeter tall obstacle. Now, it's not using perception. Just by the four senses on the foot, it can handle these kind of obstacles. Let's make it even more difficult. So now we have a debris, debris pile. Now, that is a five centimeter foam sponge, and that is very difficult. Different piles of wood, uh, different type of materials. And this robot can actually run. So running means that there's a phase of both feet off the ground. We believe this is the very first running human robot in academic setting. So this is, oh God, this is in our engineering building. It's actually walking 260 meters around the lab. So now it's finally coming back to the lab. Now at this point, everything is fully autonomous. Now notice that it's bumping into the wall and absolutely no problem. Now, you might be curious of what the robot is actually seeing. So actually, let me show you what the robot is seeing. So the robot is uh, understanding the environment using its sensors. In this case, using a uh, depth camera, oh, a stereo camera. This robot can walk up to 2.1 meters per second. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is the fastest walking human robot in the world at this point. And also it can run. But however, we do not know how fast it can run because we don't have enough uh, space in the lab right now. Okay, let's make it do some useful things, uh, you know, moving boxes. Well, disclaimer, this is a completely empty box. We just did this for fun. And then, well, it, it can do pretty well, so now let's give it a bigger box. So now it's picking, uh, picking up and uh, holding a box in real time. It's actually balancing it in real time. Now, it cannot see anything, so we made it uh, put it on its head. Yes, it can push and pull carts as well. For this, we didn't have to come up with a new behavior. We just made it walk towards the cart, and absolutely no problem. Now, this is the holy grail in human robots, as many would agree. Doing testing outdoors in the gravel pile, transitions on the grass and the pavement without any tethers. We are that confident of the stability of the walking uh, controller. So these days, we bring it out to the, the on campus every two weeks. And the students love it. They always interact uh, with the, uh, the robot. So this is Artemis. Again, it stands for Advanced Robotic Technology for Enhanced Mobility and Improved Stability. However, in our lab, Artemis stands for something different. In our lab, it stands for a robot that exceeds Messi in soccer. Because we also use this robot to play soccer. Now, you might all uh, probably uh, know the competition called RoboCup. Robocop is an international autonomous robot soccer football competition. Now the cool thing about this competition is these robots are not remote control. Everything is fully autonomous. The robots look for the ball, they kick the ball, and they actually play, uh, play a game of soccer against each other. Now the really cool thing about Robocop is the official goal of Robocop is by the year 2050, have a team of robots play soccer against the human World Cup champions and win. Isn't that cool? We've been a five-time world champion in RoboCup, but that was eight years ago. Uh, eight years ago in the final, in, uh, in the award ceremony announced to the world, uh, now we would like to give other teams uh, a chance to win, so we're not gonna cut the RoboCup anymore. However, in the future, if we have new robots and new technology that's gonna blow your mind away, then that's when we're gonna come back, and that is actually this year. So we actually participated in RoboCup 2023. This year was in Bordeaux, France. 
So we actually have two uh, Artemis robots. Again, everything is fully autonomous. Uh, this is the first time we're using this robot in a competition. Artemis Terminal. So this robot was the fastest robot, the strongest robot at the competition. It has a very strong kick as well. Many times it's very amusing to see these robots play soccer. But this was an exhibition game against Team Nimbro from Germany, who has been the, uh, the world champions for the past years. Now, of course, we still got a long way to have a soccer match against the human World Cup champions, but again, it's 2025, uh, 2050, so we still got a long way to go. Now, the people behind it, those are my students, we call these people robot handlers. They're not touching the robot, they're just there, just in case something goes wrong, because safety is important. Do it! Do it! Uh. <laughs> Now it's kicking the other robot, maybe we did that on purpose. <laughs> now for those who are in this field, you understand how difficult it is to actually have a dynamic kick. I believe this is the very first dynamic kick uh, implemented in a human robot. <sighs> maybe some calibration issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> well, just because it's strong and fast does not mean that it can win a game. So our results are, as a soccer competition was not that great. But again, we showed the future, and again next year uh, we're going to show something really, really interesting. So that's Artemis. Now, personally, I'm actually very active on social media, and one day I suddenly on Instagram I got suddenly six thousand followers, followers suddenly. So I said, what, what's happening? And I saw, this is Bill Gates, and that's the real Bill Gates, and he followed me. I think he has like 8 million followers, and he only follows like 200 people. I'm one of them. And he followed me, and he shared uh, one of our uh, uh, movie, uh, videos, and he says, it's super impressive to see Artemis as action in Robocop 2023. What's a, what an honor. <laughs> so Bill Gates is also officially a fan of our robots as well. So this is Artemis, and I cannot be uh, uh, more excited about our latest robot. And I believe this is just the beginning of something big. Uh, let me show you some of the, uh, the history of Artemis. So it's, a, it's been a six year journey so far. Now, we started this in 2018. We started with pen and uh, pe pe pencil and paper, very quick sketches and preliminary calculations. Uh, and then it looks like at least the math supports what we believe can be done. So we started to look into this in more or detail. So we needed funding. So unlike our other funded research projects, this was, uh, uh, we raised funding through uh, crowdfunding. Uh, through the UCLA Spark Fund campaign, and it raised $118,000. I don't know if there's anybody who funded us over here for the campaign. If you, or if there's some of you there, I would like to personally thank you for it. <laughs> so in 2020, what happened? COVID-19 hit. So unfortunately, we're just starting our project, and we had to close our lab. However, this does not stop us. Uh, we did distributed research. So all of our students are in our dormitory at their apartment. We start to work together via Zoom, and we continue our work in 2020. Now, 2021, I, I, I was going to skip this because we uh, showed you the video. We first assembled the first lower body. Starting 2022, we're going to do by month by month. In January, first a state estimator. Now, in February, first standing up. Well, actually, almost standing up. Okay, we're getting there. In March, uh, first balancing. You're shaking the ground, pushing it. This was March. Okay. Excuse my language. <laughs> and April, uh, it's almost taking a step. Almost there. Okay, can do it. Okay, take a step. Almost, almost. <laughs> well, this is always a, a part of the process. Okay, getting there. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, finally May. In uh, uh, July, again, last year RoboCup, we first brought the robot uh, outside the lab. This was in Bangkok, uh, Thailand, Bangkok. And this is the very, very first time it started to take a step. 
Now, after this, we figured out the problem was the state, et state estimator. So we quickly rolled our state estimator and started to show some promise. Now, in October, first stable walking, less than a year ago. Now, for those with the robotics, you know how big of a step this is, taking your robot outside of the lab. The lab is easy, it's a structured environment, but it's hard to take it outside the lab. This was uh, in uh, uh, Long Beach for the XPRIZE competition. And finally, December, first major breakdown. Now, position control robot, if something goes wrong, it's actually not that devastating. It's just moving, you can stop it. But force control, force control, because they're trying to control the force. If something goes wrong, it just does ballistic, something like these kind of motions. So it's a self-destructed. So this doesn't deter us. We uh, start to finish the sub and fix everything. Okay, this is a long video, so I'm gonna skip this. And then we reassemble it. And then finally, January, first <laughs> running. Again, running meaning both feet off the ground face. And first time taking it outside was in February this year. We have a lot of fans. <laughs> and in March, we had our official announcement for Artemis uh, this year. So this is a short history of uh, how we started Artemis past year. Now, all, of course, when you do robotics uh, uh, presentations, you always want to put some bloopers, so I put some bloopers in here as well. So again, this is before we started to put shoes on it. We just had some silicone slippers, but it's slipping. Now, if you remember seeing the videos, now we use regular shoes, Nike shoes. Uh, uh, we, we start to use regular shoes for the robot. Now again, the first uh, accident, <laughs> nobody got hurt. <laughs> As I mentioned, torque control is very difficult. Now, after that first accident, we have multiple layers of safety features. It constantly monitors for vibration, acceleration, and torque. If something goes wrong, it constantly, it just instantly cuts the power. So this is what you're seeing. If something happens, it just cuts the power. And of course, for those who do robotics, everybody had these kind of moments as well. <laughs> So again, if you ask me about three years ago, Venice, you, when do you think we'll have human robots really being used in real everyday life? Now at the time, two, three years ago, if you asked me that question, I would have said, well, you know, I would be happy if it happens in my lifetime, but we need to start now for that to happen one day. However, you ask me today, after Artemis, I'm starting to change my thoughts. I believe bicycle locomotion is a all, almost uh, solved problem. Of course, we need to still do a lot of the manipulation and different AI uh, aspects as it, but now I think it's gonna happen sooner than you think. So I will be continuing our work. I'll be continuing following my dream. Thank you very much. <laughs>